A naked man covered in blood ran down the street, crying, screaming, zigzagging wildly and looking over his shoulder as he ran. Please, oh God, help me, he said as he ran. Then, an inhumanly long arm appeared out of nowhere, grabbing him by the throat and pulling him into an alleyway. The arm was emaciated and sickly looking. Oh my God, my wife said to my right, peering out the window. Did you see that? That arm must have been ten feet long. I quickly shut the curtains. Get Sarah, I said, referring to our only child. And go to the basement. Grab as many canned foods and bottles of water as you can. I ran upstairs to get my shotgun, grabbing a couple boxes of slugs and buckshot and throwing them in a canvas bag. Police and ambulance sirens flew by outside. But I paid them no mind. They wouldn't be able to help much, if at all. We had tried calling a few minutes earlier, but the line had been busy. It was the first time I had ever heard of 911 giving a busy signal. As we all settled in the basement, a couple boxes of food and water next to us on the table, I found an old radio I kept down here in storage. It was covered in dust, but I blew on it, sending a great cloud of it into the air. My wife started coughing. I sheepishly apologized, plugging the radio in and turning it on. Civil broadcast from the United States government. A robotic female voice stated. As of 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, martial law is being declared for your local area. All emergency services are suspended until further notice. Please stay in your homes and await further instructions. Help is on the way. This is not a test. Then a loud beeping sound issued from the radio and the message started to repeat. I tried changing the station. But it was coming through on everyone. Someone started slamming on the door upstairs, and I heard the kitchen window directly above us being smashed. Be quiet, I whispered to my wife and daughter. They trembled, pale statues in the darkness of the basement. I heard heavy footsteps above us, and the sound of someone dragging something. From further down the street, I heard screaming and wood being smashed, as if someone were kicking in a door. It sounded like a car had driven into the house next door. I heard the shattering glass and rending of metal of the car hitting a structure. Then, a piercing woman's shriek. The smell of smoke began to permeate the night air. I also heard what sounded like children screaming in our front yard, and a woman who was probably their mother trying to yell instructions at them. Run, she said. Get away from... Then, her voice was cut off with a deep gurgling choking sound. The voices of her children went soon after. I had a small window in the basement, and I could see thick grey clouds of smoke outside. It obscured my view of what was going on further down the street. Should we help them? My wife said. She grabbed my hand reflexively. Her hand felt cold, and I could feel her pulse through her skin. I shook my head. Beth, we have our own child to worry about, I said. The radio says martial law has been declared, which means we just have to wait for the military to arrive. I listened for movement upstairs, but nothing else was happening that I could hear. I turned back on the radio. The robotic voice had stopped its monotonous repetition, and now a deep man's voice was speaking. He sounded calm and unhurried. I caught the tail end of what he was saying. The situation is under control. He said. I repeat, the U.S. military has the situation under control. What we ask from you, citizens of our great country, is this. Do not drink the water. Do not shower in the water. Do not cook with the water. Don't even wash your hands with the water. Only drink previously bottled water or other drinks. We believe this outbreak is the result of a localized infection of the town's water supply. An evacuation is in progress. Please stay in your homes. For your safety, Phone calls, text messages, and internet access will be restricted. We will report back when more information is available. The voice ended abruptly, and the robotic voice started speaking again. This is a civil broadcast from the United States government. As of 9.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, martial law has... I turned the radio back off. I looked at my wife. She was terrified. Have any of you drank any of the tap water lately? I asked Sarah and Beth. They all shook their heads in unison. Luckily, all three of us drank a lot of milk and juice. 
I always cursed how expensive it was, having to buy an entire gallon of whole milk and a carton of orange juice every other day. But now, I was thanking God for their taste. From the second floor of our house, we heard crashing and smashing. Then, a deep voice shouting. It sounded like someone was dragging a body down the stairs. A woman started crying. Then her voice was cut off. What's going on up there, daddy? My young daughter asked, looking up at me with her big blue eyes. She looked so small and helpless in the dim light of the basement. She was holding a brown stuffed rabbit I had given her when she was a baby, which she had named Dr. Hoppy. I don't know where he got his medical degree from, but he seemed to be doing a good job of keeping her calm, so I appreciated his bedside manner. Sarah? I said, getting down to my knee so I was on her level and putting my hand on her shoulder. I think there are sick people all around us, but help is on the way. She held her little rabbit up to me. Is Dr. Hoppy going to get sick too? She asked in a whisper. No, Dr. Hoppy is a doctor. He knows more than we do about staying healthy. I said, smiling at her. Then, something started smashing against the basement door, causing all of us to jump. I chambered around into my Bonelli, the 12 gauge, giving a satisfying ringing noise. I looked up the rickety stairs, waiting. At this distance, I could easily shoot through the basement door with a slug, but I wanted to make sure it wasn't a police officer or military personnel or even just a neighbor looking for help. I wished I had cameras in the house, but as I was looking up the stairs, something came crashing through the small basement window instead. My wife and daughter jumped, yelling. Get behind me, I said, turning the gun in the direction of the noise. I saw what looked like a toddler, still wearing cartoon characters on his clothes. But something was very wrong with his body and face. Tendrils of gray and red roots seemed to grow out of his body, crisscrossing across his skin. One eye cried blood as he looked at me, and the other had tiny gray worms crawling out of it. I could still see his pupils though, and apparently he could see me, for he began to run towards me at a superhuman speed. His mouth was opened, letting blood red vines with spikes shoot out in my direction. Even though I watched the spectacle with open mouth horror, my instinct still kicked in enough for me to know I needed to put him down. Without thinking, I fired a shot directly into his head. He was so small that the exit wound of the slug blew the entire back of his head off. He fell back, as if in slow motion. I saw gray and red tendrils whipping around crazily, moving much faster and more erratically as he died. Some of them morphed at an increased rate, sending thorns and spikes shooting out and others wrapped around the child's body, as if trying to protect him from further damage. But it was too late. Within seconds of him lying on the ground, the energy behind the tendrils seemed to weaken. The spikes receded back inside, and they began to fall randomly around and on top of his body, no longer moving. A few new tendrils shot out from the bullet wound, but those also quickly lost energy, instead falling back into the blood and gore of his face. Behind me, Sarah and Beth were still crying. I turned, seeing Sarah burying her face in Dr. Poppy, trying not to look. Beth stared at me with wide, unseeing eyes. She reminded me of pictures I had seen of shell-shocked soldiers returning from a horrifying war. In the excitement, I had forgotten about the basement door. I heard metal clattering from the direction of the door, and then the lock slowly turned. The door swung open. And what I saw there wasn't another person possessed by the vines, like I had expected. A roped man with a bone-white face stared down at me. His hands looked skeletal, almost like deformed claws, and his eyes were pure black. He smiled at me, an inhuman white grin that showed multiple blood-red tongues flicking in different directions. I have seen you. He said in a voice that sounded like thousands of voices swarming and echoing on top of one another. You will make it, Jason. I will return to you at the end of your journey. You are the only one with the ability to make it out of here. What about my family? I said, tears clouding my vision, pointing at my daughter and wife. The hooded man shrugged. That depends on your actions, he said. 
It is no concern of mine. My concern is that you make it out. Much relies on your survival, but I do not intercede with moral affairs much. I only came to give you a warning. What warning? I asked, feeling frantic. Do not trust the man in white. With that, he turned, beginning to walk away slowly. The black rope he wore ripped and shimmered as if it were made of silk. Wait, what's your name? I asked, but he ignored my question. I looked at Beth and Sarah, who were staring at me, open-mouthed. Within seconds, the men's footsteps faded into nothing. I think it's time we get out of here, I said to them. Prepare a few backpacks with some food and water, and we will have to split whatever we can carry between the three of us. I need to go get some things from upstairs before we leave, though. I think we might have a long journey ahead of us. My wife nodded, going through the storage supplies and finding a few bags. I didn't want to leave them alone for even an instant, so I stayed with them while she packed. We gave Sarah a small bag with a few cans of food and water. Sarah also put Dr. Poppy in it. Sorry, Dr. Poppy, Sarah said, frowning as she zipped up the backpack. I know you don't like small spaces, but it is only for a little while. Beth and I split heavier bags with more food and water, but we didn't overload them, as I had the feeling we might need to run. After we finished preparing in the basement, we went upstairs. I saw bodies all over our kitchen. I recognized the bodies of our neighbors and a couple of other people from town. They all had gray and red vines sticking out of their skin, unmoving. Some of them had blood pouring from both eyes, while others had mostly clear faces. Regardless, it looked like the roped men had torn them limb from limb. There were arms with red vines coming out of the bones, decapitated heads with gray tendrils loosely hanging down from their throats, and other horrors I don't want to reflect on here. I covered Sarah's eyes as we led her past the carnage, going upstairs. I found a phone up there, a special model with encryption and VPNs installed that I kept for emergencies. My technologically savvy friend had given it to me. And now, I tried turning it on and connecting. I was able to get through some of the government restrictions and connect to a weak internet source. No calls or texts would go through, however. But I wanted to at least record my story to let people know what's happening. The government will almost certainly try to cover up what is happening in our town. I plan on getting my family out and letting the world know the truth, however. No matter the cost. I led my family outside to our SUV, keeping the shotgun up and scanning both sides of the front door before they followed me out. I saw endless carnage on the street. Multiple cars had crashed into buildings, garages, and fences. And my neighbor's house was now an inferno of fire that sent out billowing black clouds into the air. Further down the street, I heard explosions. They were coming from the direction of the nearby gas station. I quickly shepherded my wife and daughter to the back seats slamming the door and running up front to the driver's seat, laying the shotgun on the passenger seat pointing towards the door. Backing out of the driveway, I nearly ran over my neighbor. She had hobbled out of the backyard of the burning house, waving her arms at me and shrieking something incomprehensible. Putting down the window, I pulled up right next to her. Mrs. Lucas was a widow who lived alone. Her husband of 40 years had been killed the previous year. He always volunteered to help the poor in the inner city cooking at soup kitchens and trying to connect the homeless with social services as part of his church community outreach program. One night, when he was leaving the soup kitchen, some thug had shot him in the chest and stolen his wallet while he bled to death on the sidewalk. Cameras had caught a fuzzy image of the young man, but he was never identified. Mrs. Lucas had never fully recovered from the death of her husband, but my family and I regularly went over to check on her and spent time with her. Mrs. Lucas? I said, putting down my window. She nodded at me, tears brimming in her eyes. My house, she said simply, pointing to the blazing structure on fire behind her. Everything I owned was in there. We need to get out of here, Mrs. Lucas, I said, pointing to the empty passenger seat. My wife and daughter joined in the chorus, saying, Come on, Mrs. Lucas, come with us. She wiped the tears out of her eyes, 
limping slowly around the car and getting into the seat slowly, sighing as she did so. As soon as she slammed the door shut, I pulled off quickly, the tires squealing. I wanted to get as far away from the fires and carnage as I possibly could, if there was anywhere to go. As I drove down the road, the fire of Mrs. Lucas's house getting further and further behind us, a massive explosion rocked the street. A small mushroom cloud of black smoke peeked above the houses further ahead. Oh god, that was the gas station, wasn't it? My wife asked. I looked in the rearview mirror. She was holding my daughter, who looked shell-shocked, staring straight ahead without seeing. Yes, I think that was the gas station, I agreed. I wanted to avoid that area, so I turned left, taking side streets. I knew a few ways out of town through little-traveled forest roads. I didn't know if the military would be blocking major thoroughfares, and I really didn't want to find out. I still had hope that they wouldn't have every small dirt road that wound through fields or forests blocked off however. As we drove further away from the houses past tobacco fields that extended for acres on both sides of us, Mrs. Lucas started making strange coughing noises. It sounded like she was choking. I looked over and saw her bent over in her seat. I couldn't see her face, but she looked like she was in agony, trying to curl up into a fetal position as much as her old body could allow. I pulled the car over quickly, parking in front of a barn. Mrs. Lucas? I said, putting my hand on her shoulder. Please, she said between choking sobs. Water! I ran out of the car, taking the shotgun with me for good measure, and opened the back door. My wife quickly passed me a bottle of water, and I handed it to Mrs. Lucas. She quickly sat up and started chugging the whole thing rapidly. She didn't look good. Her face was turning a strange yellow color like the jaundiced face of a lifelong alcoholic, and her hands were clenched into tight fists. I could see small trickles of blood where her fingernails bit into her palms. As soon as she finished the water, she sat there hyperventilating for a moment. I thought she was crying, but then I realized one of her eyes had a trickle of blood running down from it. She turned to look at me, and I saw her pupils were different sizes. One of them was fully dilated, and the other was a tiny pinpoint. I backed away instinctively. I'm sorry, she said, seeming to regain control over herself. I don't know what came over me. It must be all the stress of the day. Mrs. Lucas? I asked. You didn't drink the tap water, did you? She looked at me sideways. Of course I drink the water from my house, young man, she said. Her other eyes began to bleed now too. But I filtered it. Don't you know drinking bottled water is bad for the environment? Too much trash in the landfills and the oceans. She shook her head slowly and lazily from side to side as she spoke. Her voice seemed to deepen and gurgle. I looked back at my wife and daughter. Get out of the car, I whispered, a sense of horror overtaking me. But it was too late. A grey, sickly looking tendril shot out of Mrs. Lucas's mouth. It began to whip around wildly, my wife and daughter screaming as they felt for the door handles. Mrs. Lucas's arms began to make strange snapping noises, lengthening as she raised them towards me. It looked like the bone and joints were being broken and reforming in front of my eyes, purplish bruises and bursting capillaries forming all up and down the skin of her arms. Her fingers were turning black, the nails turning blue, as if she were dying or already dead. I backed up out of the car slowly raising the shotgun. My wife and daughter still weren't out of the car, but I was out of time. Get down! I yelled at them, hoping they heard me in time. Then I pulled the trigger. The slug blew a hole the size of a grapefruit in Mrs. Lucas's chest, then kept going, shattering the passenger side window. Her mouth opened, the jaw disengaging like a snake's as she hissed, spewing a fountain of blood towards me. I moved at the last second and the projectile bloody vomit missed my face by mere inches, falling harmlessly in the cornfield behind me. The smell of gunpowder mixed with something else that I'd never smelled before. It was a smell like vomit and ammonia mixed together, and it got stronger the closer I was to the tendrils. A black fluid with iridescent rainbows shimmering in it leaked out of the damaged tendrils around her chest. Tiny worms swarming and writhing in the alien blood as it soaked the seat and floor of the SUV. My ears were ringing from shooting the shotgun, but I could hear the muffled sounds of my wife and daughter still screaming. I pulled open the back door and yanked Sarah out, 
then gave Beth a hand. Small red tendrils erupted out of Mrs. Lucas's chest, languidly feeling around the windshield and back seat before seeming to run out of energy, falling limply to the floor of the car. Is Mrs. Lucas all right? Sarah asked in her little voice, looking up at me. She had her little pink backpack on her. My wife knelt down next to her and whispered something in her ear. It felt like I couldn't talk. I just stood there breathing fast, my vision covered in a white shimmering as waves of adrenaline and anxiety overtook me. I did not want to get back into that car. I didn't know how contagious the blood was, but I remembered the warning on the radio. Don't even wash your hands with the water. Could touching contaminated blood infect me or my family? I didn't know, and I didn't want to find out. Come on, I said, grabbing the bags from the back seat and handing them to my family. We're walking from here. It might be better anyway. The military might be tracking cars by helicopter or satellite. I remembered seeing movies where evil corporations or governments shot anyone who tried to escape a quarantine area, and shivers ran down my spine. Jason? Look! My wife said in horror, pointing behind me. I looked at the spot where her trembling finger pointed. The projectile blood that Mrs. Lucas had vomited before her death, a few earthworms writhed on top of the soil, elongating and mutating in front of my eyes. Within seconds, they had grown to a couple feet long, sharp red spikes extruding to their shiny skin. Tiny eyes on stalks were sprouting from the fronts of their bodies at an incredible speed. Dozens of little black orbs that vibrated and searched the surrounding environment. The new mouths opened beneath the eyes, with teeth as thin as needles poking out from their searching maws. Get back, I said, trying to push my family back from the mutating worms. The worms all responded to the sound of my voice, raising their heads like snakes who smell prey, and a few began slithering in my direction. Run! We all started sprinting down the street. The worms creeped behind us at an unbelievable pace, almost catching up with me even as I sprinted as fast as I could. As my family and I all ran for our lives, I chambered a round of buckshot in the shotgun, then turned rapidly and shot at the few worms behind us. The spread of the shotgun blast took out all three of them, stopping them instantly. Ten jewels a few inches long shot out of their bodies, searching for a moment before falling onto the pavement. I put another round of buckshot in the chamber for good measure, but nothing else moved around us. Then I heard a strange humming coming from further down the road. I turned to my wife. Do you hear that? I asked in a low voice. She nodded. It almost sounds like a Tibetan singing bowl, she said. I looked at her blankly. It is a resonant bowl used for meditation that produces a humming sound. Beth knew all about yoga and meditation. I don't like it, I said. Walking forward slowly, I saw a crowd of people standing around in a circle in a grassy field. All of them with their mouths opened, their faces pointing up at the sky. The writhing tendrils of the infection burst out of their skins, endlessly searching in the warm air. Sometimes, the tendrils would wrap around one another and towards the center of the circle. One thick vine sent out from the chest of every monster intertwined. A smell like starter fluid and vomit rose from the group, so pungent that I could almost taste it. Before I knew what was happening, I felt the muzzle of a rifle push into the side of my head. A man dressed in all black was hiding at the edge of the tobacco field. He had used my temporary distraction to gain the advantage over me. Drop the gun. Slowly. He whispered through his gas mask. And don't make a sound. If you try those things over here, you and your family will surely die. He spoke calmly, equally, as if he were stating a fact rather than making a threat. I slowly put my hands up, the shotgun loosely held in my right one, and then tossed it in a patch of grass. It fell with a soft thud. None of the members of the mutated group noticed the sound, however. Do you see them? The man with the gun whispered to me. They're forming a hive mind. They're exchanging genetic materials. This thing evolves fast. How do you know? I asked, and he only chuckled. Come on, he said, lowering his gun. You and your family are to come with me. There is a scientific installation nearby that is still quarantined and secure. 
We're taking the uninfected survivors there until we get new orders. I looked behind me at my family, going over to join them. His words struck a chord of anxiety in me. Until we get new orders. But I wasn't sure why. What's your name? I asked the man quietly. You can just call me X, he said. And I already know yours, Jason. We have been monitoring cameras located all over the town, as well as tracking the movement of vehicles by satellite. The government plans to restore order in this town block by block. And if it can't be done, then the place will be wiped off the map. There can be no risk of this thing spreading beyond here. Behind X, in the tobacco fields, I saw two more soldiers dressed in all black. They were also wearing gas masks and carrying M4 carbines with sound suppressors screwed in at the ends. X nodded at them and made some sort of hand gesture, and the two other soldiers fell in at both sides of myself and my family. It involved going through the field on the opposite side of the road as the hive of monsters. As we moved, the crunching of our feet on the grass, the only sound besides the humming coming from the field. I realized the sky was darkening. Flashes of lightning lit up the horizon. I heard someone screaming from the field across the road. My first thought was that one of the monsters had spotted us and was alerting its fellows as to our presence. All of us whipped around, the soldiers raising their weapons. But I quickly realized it was highly unlikely any of the monsters could even see us. We were hidden behind a curve in the tobacco field, looking through some of the plants to observe them and the rapid darkening of the sky would likely make it even harder to spot our silhouettes. Instead of the monsters looking for others outside their group, two new ones were bringing someone in. I squinted, trying to see harder. The prisoner looked like a skinny young man, or maybe a teenager. He had wiry black hair and glasses. He shrieked and fought against his captors the entire way, but they easily overpowered him. The tendrils of the captors had wrapped around his arms and hands like living chains. They otherwise did not touch him, except for a small grapevine that would escape from one of their mouths, caress the hostage's cheek and forehead, and then disappear back into the host's body. It almost gave me the impression that the hive mind wanted to keep him calm, or maybe he was just sampling the goods. As soon as the hostage was within a few feet of the group, the circle scattered, seeming to regain much of their individuality. The prisoner looked around feverishly, I then seemed to notice our group. I don't know if it was the glint of some light off of one of the rifles or some flash of color from our clothing, but he looked right at us. Then he began screaming, the vines wrapping faster and faster on his legs. Help me, he said, trying to point as a great tendril wrapped around his mouth, gagging him. The monsters in the group noticed his agitation and yelling and also looked over in our direction. I was trying to crouch lower to the ground. The soldiers were feverishly whispering to each other. Then, as one member not open a red tendril with his bare teeth, others began running in our direction. I saw the great tendril wrapped around the hostage's mouth pull away, and the one issuing the black fluid took its place. It forced the young man to drink, wrapping underneath his lips as fluid spurted out of it in an arterial fashion. I nearly gagged just watching it. We have to go. X said to me, the first glint of excitement and blood lost in his eyes. I stood quickly, watching Sarah and Beth jog in front of me, hand in hand, as X led the way. The two other soldiers stayed behind us, and I caught glimpses of them checking our backs multiple times. The monsters were gaining on us, and if we were going much farther, I had a feeling we wouldn't make it, at least not without a gunfight. Those nearest to us out of the group began to run at a superhuman speed. My daughter could not keep up with the soldiers, so I picked her up and began to sprint. It was clear that we were not getting away. Then, I heard sniper rifles begin shooting from the forest up ahead, and I sighed in relief, my heart bursting in my chest from the effort of sprinting while carrying a 40-pound child in a backpack full of supplies. The forest was only 30 or 40 yards away. The soldiers stopped, let my wife and I pass by, and then began to open fire with their rifles. The gunshots were deafening, even though none of them were using full auto bursts. Between the hidden snipers and the three soldiers, they were taking down five or six of the mutated people every few seconds. There was a screaming sound from one of the monsters, like a wailing infant, and the rest of the group immediately stopped and scattered in all directions. A few more shots rang out and a couple more bodies fell across the field. But then, 
everything was quiet. All I could hear was the ringing in my ears and the heavy breathing of my daughter and myself. I got a bottle of water out of the backpack, and drinking the whole thing and giving another bottle to her. She just stared at it for a few seconds. Are we getting out of here? She asked. My wife looked down at her in surprise. Of course we are getting out of here, my wife said. Why would you think otherwise? My daughter pointed to the dead bodies littering the field. None of those people are getting out of here, Sarah said. I saw the three soldiers entering the forest. X was looking at us with an inscrutable expression. We have a much larger group headed this way, he said to us. Satellite imagery shows it may have over 500 people. Apparently, the first phase has ended and the second has begun. What do you mean by first phase? My wife asked him. He shrugged. The chaotic nature of the transformations, some of the mutants ripping others apart, total psychotic breakdowns in predisposed individuals, all of that kept them disorganized, easy to kill as long as you had weapons. But if they are forming into larger and larger hive minds, then that will not continue. It means our time to get out of here is quickly running out. He started walking forward again, motioning for us to follow. But luckily, the scientific installation is only a few hundred yards away. We have time to get there and barricade it, if necessary. They may not even know where it is or how to find it. There's nothing out this way, I replied. This is all woods and fields for the next few miles, and then you get to the national park, which is another twenty miles of forests. X shook his head, smiling slightly. You'll see. The other soldiers didn't talk at all. They looked unhappy and were reloading their guns. We followed X on a deer trail and a few minutes later entered an abandoned barn. He walked directly to the center of it, clearing off ancient looking hay and twigs and revealed the number pad where he entered a series of numbers so fast that I couldn't follow the sequence. There was a quiet beeping sound and a round concrete entrance opened up revealing a ladder that went into a well-lit hallway a story below. We climbed down one by one. My wife, daughter and I were redirected into a room with a couch and a television. The cable and power down here had apparently never been affected like it was in the rest of the town. I opened up my phone and found that they had open Wi-Fi access down here and began to record my story. After a few minutes, the soldiers came back, all of them having a sour expression on their faces. The head scientists are MIA for now. Exit frowning. We will have to wait. I have no idea where they are or what they are doing. They were supposed to wait here for rescue. Part of my orders are to get them out of here. I nodded to him, handing out peanut butter crackers and water to my family while I finished recording the story on my phone. X didn't seem to notice or care. Across the facility, I heard another beeping sound and the faint noise of a door opening. The echo of muffled voices reached out to us across the polished hallways and laboratory rooms. Apparently, the wait was over. I saw the soldiers coldly look up at the two scientists in lab coats as they walked into the building. One was a tall man with blonde hair and blue eyes, the other a short Asian woman. The man walked up to me, extending his hand. Sorry to meet you under such horrible circumstances, he said with a half smile. We're doing everything we can to deal with this issue, those monstrosities outside. You are Jason Emery, right? I nodded, not trusting this man at all. Where were you two? I asked. Oh, just taking some samples from the nearby streams, he said. The Asian woman looked away. My name is Dr. Booth, and this is Dr. Lau. She looked back at us, nodding her head quickly. She looked incredibly uncomfortable to be in the room with us. Are we being evacuated? My wife asked. The doctor looked over at her, narrowing his eyes slightly, as if Beth were a fly he wanted to swat away. Then, the charismatic half-smile returned to his face. Of course, he said his tone one of total confidence. The National Guard, the Army, and the Green Berets are on their way. 
We are simply trying to evacuate as many of the uninfected to a secure location as possible before undertaking such a large evacuation procedure. But the Air Force is sending countless helicopters as we speak. I saw X and the other two soldiers look away, their faces still cold and emotionless. I had a feeling I was being fed a line of bullshit. But to what end? I didn't know. I heard screaming, muffled but distinct, coming from the direction where we had entered the underground laboratory. There were panic shrieks, gunshots and slamming noises as I heard the hatch open with a soft beeping noise. Help us! A male voice cried. They're coming! His words were drowned out in a deep gurgling sound, as if he were choking. I couldn't see the hatchway entrance, but I heard a thudding sound, as if a body were being dropped down the ladder. The soldiers looked at each other before rising to their feet and running towards the hatchway. What's going on? My wife asked. Just stay here, Dr. Booth said. The military has it under control. It didn't sound like the military had it under control in the slightest. I heard a few male voices screaming. Then automatic rifle began echoing throughout the tunnels. I heard Axe yelling, Retreat! I pulled my wife and daughter closer to me on the sofa. I think we need to get out of here, my wife whispered to me. My daughter had taken Dr. Hoppy, her stuffed rabbit, out of her backpack and was hugging it tightly. Daddy, I don't want to be here anymore, Sarah said to me, looking up at me with her big eyes. I nodded, grabbing both of their hands and rising. We could use the distraction to try and run further in. I heard more and more commotion coming from the hatchway. Then suddenly, X tore down the hallway. Blood gushing from a huge slice in his forehead. It soaked the entire right side of his face. Dr. Lau and Dr. Booth were in the corner of the room, whispering to each other. And I nodded to my wife and daughter, pulling them up. We took off down the hallway in the direction X had gone. Dr. Booth tried yelling something after us, but I ignored him completely. I saw drops of blood in the direction X had run, like breadcrumbs that would hopefully lead us to the correct path. I couldn't believe how huge this underground laboratory truly was. It was like a maze. And without the drops of blood to follow, I would have become impossibly lost in minutes. After a few minutes, I saw X up ahead, seeming to slow down significantly. He was limping now, constantly wiping blood out of his face so he could see. Somewhere along the way, he had lost his rifle. He pulled out his pistol, putting it to his head. Wait! I screamed at him. He looked back at me. It's too late for me, he said. I'm infected. I can feel it. It feels horrible, like something is grabbing my heart and squeezing it. He coughed up a wad of bloody sputum, spitting it on the floor before wiping his mouth quickly. His other eye had started bleeding, but he still stared through the trickle of blood at me as he put the gun to his temple and pulled the trigger. He fell as if in slow motion his brains spraying the white painted walls of the hallway. I heard footsteps running behind me and saw Dr. Booth coming up. Damn it, he wasn't supposed to die, Dr. Booth said. I sprinted ahead to the corpse of X, grabbing the pistol out of his hand. The words of the black robed man who had come into my house at the beginning of all this rang in my head. Do not trust the man in white. I turned to raise the pistol towards him, but he was one step ahead of me. He had already grabbed my daughter. He had a small revolver he was holding up to her head. He must have had it in a hidden holster. How about you drop that gun before I kill this little bitch? The doctor said, smiling like a corpse. His charismatic persona was gone now, and the monster underneath was revealed. His eyes looked as dark as black holes. If you kill her, I'll kill you, I said, raising the gun at him. I wasn't giving up the only leverage I still had here. My wife was standing a few feet next to him, her eyes haunted and shell-shocked. My daughter stood there like a mannequin, just looking down at her toes. I wondered what kind of psychological trauma she would have to live with after all of this was over, if we survived. Why don't you tell us what this is all about? I don't believe you had nothing to do with it. He laughed uproariously, but his eyes didn't laugh. They stayed dark and flat. You're not a dumb man, he said. I'm surprised you didn't figure it out earlier. 
I'm the one who released the pathogen into the town's water supply. But why? I asked. Why would you want to kill an entire town? Kill them? He repeated. I never wanted to kill anyone. Though surely, to make an omelet, you need to crack a few eggs. I think we all know that. We had originally found the alien fungus, if you can even call it a fungus, in a meteorite that landed in Antarctica. It appears, on the world, this organism evolved. The differences between fungi, plants, and animals are not as distinctive as on Earth. On its own, the fungi can move, breathe, and even hunt small animals. But more interestingly, this fungi also has the ability to overtake any animal life and create a hive mind out of them. They also take memories and skills from the individual members of the group and use it for furtherance of the hive. In our early experiments, we found that certain leaders of the hive mind, the soldiers and kings and queens, produce a substance that reverses cancer, injuries, even death in other members of the hive. We call it the royal jelly, just like in bee colonies. But this is far more monumental of a discovery. If we allow the fungus to reproduce among large groups of human and reach its natural state, we can find the alpha organisms among the hive harvest the royal jelly, and use it to reverse aging, heart disease, cancer, AIDS, and countless other diseases. Can you imagine the potential scientific value such a discovery would have? We could potentially keep people alive forever, at least those with value to the world. And how do you know that it wouldn't just turn the patient into one of those things? I asked. How do you know this royal jelly doesn't just make you a slave to the hive mind? He shrugged. It never did in animal studies, the doctor said. Now that you understand, why don't we both put down the guns? You realize that, with this kind of scientific advance, your daughter could live for centuries. Just one more question, I asked. Did the US government know you released this alien fungus into the water supply? He laughed at this. The US government is too slow and fat to move quickly. Dr. Booth said. They gave me funding for animal studies. But no, I took it upon myself. That was the last thing I heard him say. At that point, my wife quietly came up from behind him. She yanked his gun hand back with all of her strength in her right hand, while slamming an open folding knife into his eye with her left hand. The shock and pain made him fire a single round, but it went high, into the top of the wall. My daughter screamed falling to the floor and crawling towards me. Daddy? She said, and I ran up to her, scooping her up and checking her for injuries. She seemed totally unharmed, other than some scrapes and bruises. The doctor was screaming something. It sounded like, you bitch, but with all the blood running into his mouth, it was almost incomprehensible. My wife had taken his gun and pointed it at the back of his head. Should we kill him? She asked. I shook my head. You should take Sarah and go forward, I said. I'll take care of him. As they walked forward, I took the pistol I had gotten from the body of X and raised it, pointing directly at the center of the doctor's head. He was blubbering and shrieking. But in his last moments, a certain clarity came over his one good eye. He stared at me with hatred as I fired, blowing the top of his head open and covering the ceiling and walls in gore. Some of it even splashed back on me, tiny droplets of blood that scattered over my mouth and face. As I looked around at the mess, the corpses, the blood, and everything else, I had a totally absurd thought. Well, someone's gonna have a hell of a time trying to clean this up. I thought to myself, laughing like a maniac. We wandered through the hallways for hours before accidentally stumbling upon Dr. Lau in a room. She was sitting in the corner, drinking a cup of tea. She looked up surprised. As she took in the three of us, covered in blood and scratches, she frowned. Is he dead? She asked simply. I nodded. She sighed. Thank God. He was a lunatic, Dr. Booth. I was afraid of him. I always thought he would try to make me into one of those things without telling me, maybe putting a drop of it in my tea or something. 
he became so obsessed with seeding the fungus in larger and larger animals that I knew it was only a matter of time until he tried infecting humans. I had no idea he would do it to a whole town though. She stopped and sipped some more of the green tea. Do you know a way out of here? I asked, holding my daughter to my side. She nodded. You know, he was going to take you and your family as subjects. She said, Purposely infest your whole family. I nodded at that, thinking back to the warning of the black-robed men. Yes, there is a way out that leads to the middle of the forest. I'll take you there. I'm not going with you, however. I'm staying down here until reinforcements arrive, if they ever do. We followed her through the labyrinth of halls and rooms until we reached a ladder at the end of one hall. At the top was a hatch. The code is 339. Good luck. She turned and went back in the direction she had come. I climbed through it, helping my daughter and wife out. We looked around and saw a seemingly endless forest. Luckily, I had grown up around here, and I knew a lot of these woods like the back of my hand. I knew we were in a state park that bordered the tobacco fields at the north of town, and that the park had trails extending to the surrounding towns. It was just a matter of finding one of the right ones. We hiked for miles, eventually coming to a clearing. In it, I saw another circle of mutated humans, their tendrils intertwined in the middle. Beneath it, I saw the corpse of X, half of his face missing. They allowed drops of black liquid to fall into his open mouth, and he began to stir. Tendrils shot out of his shattered face sewing up the hole and leaving a writhing mass of stubby gray spikes in its place. In low grunts, he pointed to various directions. The tallest and strongest members of the group ran in those directions. I heard sniper rifles firing, then men screaming, and within minutes, everything was silent. I thought to myself that this must be the royal jelly that the doctor was so obsessed with. It appeared it could even bring back certain infected individuals from the dead. The hive mind still gathered, and I wondered if they would use the knowledge taken from X and the other soldiers to break any military quarantine and expand beyond the borders of this destroyed town. As I thought about this, I saw all the members of the circle moving their heads up in unison. They turned their faces up to the sky, their mouths opened as a soft rain began to fall. As the rain fell, the tentacles of the monsters seemed to quiver faster, vibrating with barely concealed pleasure. Their faces were all turned up to the sky, the drops falling into their deformed, mutated mouths. A voice came from nearby, whispering. It was the voice of the roped man who I had seen in the beginning. The man with black eyes and a sickly body, like that of a cancer patient in his last days. The voice split and echoed in the quiet forest. You have been betrayed, he said. Right now, Dr. Lau is giving Dr. Booth intravenous injections of the royal jelly. He has been brought back to life with high doses of the serum and will become the leader of the hive, the king of the monsters. What? I whispered, turning and looking. The voice seemed to come from behind a cluster of trees, but I was afraid to move too close to it. It would potentially allow the group of the mutated monsters to see me. The rain soaked into my clothes, my backpack, and my supplies. I wished I still had my shotgun, which I was far more familiar with, but all I had was a pistol with no extra magazines. Did you hear that? I said, turning to my wife and daughter. They both nodded. Why is that man's voice so weird, Daddy? Sarah said. She seemed to be recovering well from the shock. The resilience of children is something miraculous. She had seen people murdered in front of her eyes and had a gun held to her head. Her eyes had lost some of the innocence they had earlier today. They looked flat and motionless. I went to her and hugged her. Don't worry, baby. I said. He is on our side. He is the one who killed the bad people in our home earlier. She hugged me back, her tiny arms wrapping around my neck. I kissed her on her forehead, brushing dirty wet strands of hair out of her face. And yet, 
I wondered how true my statement really was. What was this being? A demon? And whose side was he really on? So what do you want to do now? Beth asked. I looked up at her. Well, as far as I see it, we have three choices. We can go back to the laboratory and deal with the scientists there, which seems like a terrible option. I don't even know how to get back to where we were originally. The place is like a labyrinth. We can try to hike our way out of here to the nearest town, or we can find somewhere to hide and wait for the military to come in. If they're actually coming at all, assuming they don't just want to shoot us on sight. Beth shook her head. We can't count on the government, she said. What if they just quarantine this whole area or drop a nuclear bomb or chemical weapons on it to wipe it out? Yeah, my thoughts exactly, I said. So we can either go forward or go back. If Dr. Lao is giving people that royal jelly, whatever kind of serum that comes out of these creatures, then she could be creating whole armies of these things. I really thought she might be on our side. I sighed. That means Dr. Booth has resurrected far stronger than before. And with the whole hive behind him, he will be like X or even worse. I don't know if it is dose dependent, but if she has stockpiles of pure royal jelly, then I think we should count on that. Dr. Booth might become some sort of sick leader. He is, after all, one of the most intelligent and the most insane and psychopathic. I just don't understand why she would do that, Beth said, shaking her head. I shrugged. She sighed heavily. I think we need to go back. She pulled the pistol she had taken from Dr. Booth from her waistband. And I think we may need to stop Dr. Lau before she can do anything else. However, the decision was taken away from us. On the top of the nearest hill, I saw a silhouette of a man walking casually, tendrils whipped crazily around his body and head. I squinted. Beth and Sarah both looked too. Beth had better eyesight than me. Get back behind the trees, Beth hissed at us. I grabbed Sarah, hiding behind an oak tree. I looked over at a group of monsters as well. They had stopped, standing still as statues, watching the approaching men. Only... Their tentacles vibrated and shimmered still. X stood in the lead, welcoming the leader home to his hive. I heard the mutated, gurgling voice of Dr. Booth as he hailed them. I have seen death coming on a pale horse, he shrieked. What horrors await us on the other side of the veil? And yet, we have conquered death. The overman am I. Like lightning from the sky, I appear and ask you to join me. We will take the world, remake it greater and more beautiful than before, and exterminate all those who stand in our way. The hive burst with excitement, and the eyes of the mutated humans shining with glee. I peeked out from behind the tree, and when I saw the mutated form of Dr. Booth, I gasped. His clothes hung in tatters around his body. His legs and arms had stretched to enormous lengths. He looked like he was twice as tall as a normal man now, his arms stretching far below his knee. The place where I had shot him had regrown grey, pulsating flesh. Blood dripped from his eyes like crimson tears. His mouth hung down like a snake's, unhinging and allowing red and grey tendrils to squirm around as he spoke. The hive moved apart, letting him into the center, welcoming their king. I saw black and purple bruises all over his torso and neck. He coughed, a grating sound that sprayed frothy blood onto the ground. Cold chills ran down my spine. We have life ones here, Dr. Booth said, scanning the others. I think they're in the forest. I think they may even be watching us right now. Bring them as sacrifices for the transition to the next stage of humanity. Bring them as food for us. We will drink their blood and tear them limb from limb. Save the little girl for me. The hive mind began to scatter, the group dissolving as dozens of mutated people moved in all different directions. Dr. Booth stayed where he was, head bowed, looking like a man in prayer. Other than the whipping tendrils and vines emanating from his ruined body, he stood as still as a mannequin. I wondered if he was communicating with the greater hive of the town, sending out telepathic messages to the countless mutated animals and humans. 
Oh God, Beth whispered. What do we do now? They're coming. My heart was beating in my chest so hard that I feared the hive would hear it. I was breathing hard. Visions of seeing my family tortured to death running through my head. I looked down at Sarah, whose white, frightened eyes stared off into the distance. I wondered if it would be more merciful to put a bullet in their heads rather than letting them be caught by these monsters. But what if they just brought them back? What if I ended up like X? Even it couldn't save people from such a horrible fate, apparently. Even death offered no escape. I peeked around the tree, seeing X and a few others closing in on us. The others had gone off in different directions, but we couldn't take on four of those things with the amount of ammo we had. I needed to decide now whether to kill my family and save them from torture, or whether to run or stay and fight. As they closed within 50 feet of us, helicopters began buzzing overhead. The creatures looked up, disturbed. They began to disperse, hiding in the thick brush and behind ancient trees. Soon, all I could see was Dr. Booth, standing tall and as still as a statue in the clearing. Apaches and black hawks flew in formation, hovering over the forest. Dozens of men in full military gear and gas masks began rappelling down lines dropping into the forest nearby. I could hear the leader speaking to them, his voice muffled as he yelled through the gas mask. Remember your orders, men. The leader said to the group of a few dozen who quickly regrouped around him. Destroy all witnesses, grab as much royal jelly as you can, and if possible, take a few of these things alive, especially a king. The leaders of the pack can grow to 10 or 11 feet tall. Look for those ones above all others. The director wants to study them. Do not kill any kings unless absolutely necessary. Like that one? One of the men said, pointing a gloved hand at Dr. Booth. They all turned, exclaiming in surprise. Get him, the leader said. I saw the men did not have automatic rifles. Most of them had what looked like flamethrowers. Thick canisters strapped on their backs, full of flammable material. I wondered for a moment if they carried flamethrowers. Because, as I had seen, guns didn't work. They could be brought back to life by the royal jelly, even after getting shot in the head. The soldiers didn't hesitate. A group of men had specialized guns I had never seen before. They looked almost like bazookas. But as they closed in on Dr. Booth and fired, I realized they were some sort of specialized net-firing guns. The net instantly wrapped around Dr. Booth, crushing his tendrils together against his body. He finally looked up. I saw he was smiling widely. The net was attached by a thick black rope to the gun. The team all started to grab it and drag it back, tightening the net. Dr. Booth was knocked to his feet, a massive creature dragged by faceless agents of the government. But he didn't seem concerned in the least. In fact, he started laughing, a sound like the grating of metal. He spit thick black fluid from his unhinged jaw as he was dragged across the leaves and branches. I then just kept laughing, a lunatic sound that reverberated and echoed through the forest. Just hearing the glee and insanity in his voice sent chills down my spine. Finally, you cowards come crawling out of your holes, he said in a deep, gurgling voice. But it is, I am afraid, too late. He began to hum some tune, a low sound that traveled much farther than it should have. After a few notes, I recognized it. The Rite of the Valkyrie by Wagner. The soldiers looked around, checking their backs. Even though I couldn't see their faces through their black gas masks, I could almost see their faces in my mind's eye. Scared, uncertain, afraid of being ambushed by creatures they had never encountered before. And they were right to be. As the leader called in on his radio for the helicopter to come back and send down a line to pick up their prize, members of the hive began to rush at them from all directions. I saw X in the lead, channeling his troops into military formation. Around his feet, mutated earthworms slithered as long as snakes with black eyes on stalks that flitted around in all directions. They had murderous fangs and oozed dark fluid, tiny red tendrils writhing beneath their bodies pushing them forward at a faster and faster pace. 
The soldiers screamed and began shooting their flamethrowers, trying to reform into a circular formation. But they were too slow. Some of the members of the hive had hid in the brush close by, waiting for them to come within 10 or 15 feet of their location. They sent out grey and red tentacles, stretching and wrapping around the necks of the soldiers. The flamethrowers ignited a few of the worms and mutated men and women. They shrieked, a shrill sound that reminded me of the cry of fisher cats I had heard in the woods, but with notes of agony and fury mixed in. They ran forward, flaming torches in the shape of people, insane kamikaze agents unafraid of death as long as it was for the good of the hive. Even as they screamed their eerie cries of pain, they wrapped their flaming arms and tendrils around the soldiers, igniting their backpacks. The tying cries of soldiers and mutated hive members mixed together. In all of this, I saw Dr. Booth, still smiling, still humming Wagner. Within minutes, only a couple of the soldiers were still alive. X walked forward, stretching his mutated, lengthened arms towards Dr. Booth, freeing him from the net and lifting the massive humanoid to his feet. He looked at the king with adoration, his bloody eyes gleaming. I suggest you find somewhere safer to go. A voice from behind me said. I turned, seeing the skeletal, demonic man in the black robes standing there. He smiled wide at me. Who are you? I whispered. Why are you helping me? I figure introductions are in order, friend, since you have made it this far. He said. My name is Semael. I am here to ensure your survival. You are necessary to my master's plans. I suggest you run back to the laboratory as fast as you can. The final battle is about to begin. Are you here to help my family too? I asked. He laughed. No, I don't care about them. They can die. They can burn alive. They can turn into those things. Only you need to survive. I will reveal all at the end. If you can make it that far. The reinforcements from your government are arriving in droves now. And the thousands of members of the Hive are coming this way. Samael said, grinning white. He put his emaciated hands up to the dreary sky, putting his head back and closing his jet black eyes in an expression of ultimate pleasure. His multiple snake-like tongues flicked out of his mouth each writhing and undulating in a different direction as it did so, like trying to taste all the possible currents of the air. Run if you value your life. Run as fast as you can. Get out of here. Now. And I did. I grabbed my daughter and my wife, and I ran back towards the laboratory. I entered the code, taking refuge in the tunnels under the ground. The internet still worked. As I wait here for the final battle to start, I can only record my story, hoping that it will not be my last testament before death. As my family huddled in a random room of the labyrinthine maze of the underground laboratory, I heard dozens of helicopters and jets passing overhead. They seemed to hover near the hidden government site. The voices of soldiers could be heard shouting orders. Part of me wanted to go look outside, but I knew that my family and I would likely be caught in a crossfire between the armies of the US government and the hive mind who truly controlled the area. We ate peanut butter crackers and sipped sodas and juices, trying to regain our energy. I was exhausted. I had hiked countless miles since the crisis had started, seen so many deaths and knew in my heart that the worst was yet to come. I had blisters all over my feet, and my legs were throbbing. My head hurt. I was in fairly good shape and had often hiked five or six miles in a single day. But this was ridiculous. I felt like I must have walked at least 15 miles since this crisis began. My wife and daughter were in even worse shape. My daughter pulled off her shoes, crying as she showed me blisters that had burst there. She was not used to this kind of exertion. We had seen no sign of Samael since the forest, though I thought he was likely nearby. He seemed to feed off of the death and pain like a tick feasting on blood. 
His eyes had gleamed with euphoria and a childish glee as he licked the air in the forest where so many had died. Like he could taste the deaths of the townspeople in the air and found it the sweetest treat he could imagine. My wife held my daughter in her arms, trying to do something with her matted, dirty hair. We talked about better times and vacations we would take if we survived this. My daughter had always wanted to go to Disney World, and I promised that if we got out of this death trap of a town, I would take her. She held her stuffed rabbit, Dr. Hoppy tight. That was when the gunfire and screaming started. We were in a room near the hidden exit of the laboratory. Do you think X and the doctor will bring the hive down here? My wife asked. It was an issue I had been thinking about. The answer was, truthfully, yes. Dr. Booth was a genius and a psychopath. He knew as well as I did that if the government troops kept getting killed, they might revert to something drastic, just as they had in World War II. For all I knew, a nuclear weapon was on its way to this town as we spoke. If the government begins to deploy weapons of mass destruction to wipe out the town, then certainly, I said, they will take refuge down here and wait for it to pass, then try to escape and spread the hive farther and farther. This is just the first step for them. Dr. Booth wants world domination, with himself as the king of a freakish new human race. It was just a guess, but it felt right. He had declared himself as the Overman after his resurrection from death. But I didn't think Nietzsche in his most depraved nightmares would have imagined an Overman like Dr. Booth, with bloody eyes, broken and elongated limbs, black and purple bruises all over his destroyed body, and immensely strong tentacles emerging from his mouth and head and body. I could only hope the US military would destroy him first. He seemed the greatest threat to not only my family, but to the world. The shrieking of dying monsters reverberated through the tunnels. Suddenly, I heard a sound that sent my heart into my throat. The hatchway of the tunnel being opened by someone who had just entered the coat. I heard a beeping and the pneumatic tubes of the automated metal door opening. Oh God, I whispered, putting my finger to my lips. My wife and daughter instantly went silent. I walked as silently as I could to the front of the room, closing the door and locking it before turning off the light switch. I held my pistol up in the pitch dark, ready to start shooting at anything that came through that door. Secure the premises, I heard a man say loudly, his echoing voice muffled through the door. I want all the research documents of Dr. Booth and Dr. Lau. Bring any survivors to me. If they are affiliated with the research, they are important enough to warrant an evac. Now move! We have limited time until Operation Holy Cyclone begins. Heavy boots began to storm through the hallways, flinging open doors and yelling clear after everyone. They drew closer and closer. I knew I was doomed. A hand fell on the doorknob to our locked storage room. It tried jiggling it, shaking the door. The soldier kicked at it with his legs, sending pounding echoes through the room. It didn't move though it shuddered in its frame. A wave of anxiety overtook me. Would this never end? We have a locked room, he said to someone else loudly. Then break the fucking door down. Someone else snarled back. I stepped to the side, fearing how they might accomplish that. I whispered to my wife and daughter. Get to the side of the room, I said slowly. Yes, daddy, Sarah's tiny voice answered me. Then, a gunshot rang out. The lock exploded, and the door flew open with a strong kick from the man on the other side. The sudden light flooding the room blinded me. Two soldiers with automatic weapons drawn. The first one I put down with a shot to the head. His gas mask blew apart, a spray of blood and bone showering the white walls of the laboratory behind him. The second saw my wife holding my daughter in her arms and exclaimed something inaudible under his mask. Then. He opened fire. With a scream, my wife was shot in the chest. I emptied my magazine, running at him and shooting at his torso and chest. He dropped quickly with a gurgling cry, choking on his own blood as a bullet caught him in the throat. More soldiers began running down the hall at the sound of the gunfire and cries. And suddenly, 
the white walls began to glow red, like they were being consumed by fire. Samael walked through, grinning, flicking his freakish tongues out. He was surrounded by demonic creatures with blackened skin and glowing crimson eyes. Your government has unleashed their shock troopers, their first line to destroy all the innocents here. He said to the soldiers, his voice echoing and booming through the underground complex. But hell has our own shock troopers. The soldiers began opening up at Samael and the demons with automatic weapons fire. But more and more demons poured out behind them. I looked into the void where the hall had been and saw a horrific sight. Flames licked the ground in a wasteland with dark red clouds and steep cliffs going as far as the eye could see. The first few demons in the row had their heads and chests blown apart by bullets. But Samael moved in a blur, dodging everyone. With superhuman speed, he reached the front line of the soldiers, reaching out his skeletal hands and ripping off their arms with immense strength. He took the severed limbs and began smashing them into the soldiers behind them, knocking them to the ground. Holding a severed arm in each hand like a baseball bat, he began breaking the skulls of the line of soldiers around him. They fired their guns blindly into the ceiling as the demons fell upon them, using their clawed hands to rip through their black SWAT suits into their chests, tearing out their still beating hearts and shoving the bloody organs into their open mouths, their countless fangs chewing and spitting out frothy blood. More and more demons poured out of the opening, quickly overwhelming the dozens of soldiers in the hallway. Within half a minute, all of them had gone silent, only the sounds of chewing and sighs of pleasure now coming down to me. Turning to my wife, I saw with horror that she was losing great amounts of blood. Her chest wound spurted bright red arterial gouts of blood in time with her heartbeat. Her pupils were dilated, her lips turning blue. Beth! I cried. Get Sarah out of here, she whispered to me. If it is the last thing you do, save our daughter. I ran over to her, cradling her head in my arms. My daughter was weeping behind her. No, mommy, Sarah cried. Make it stop, daddy. Make it stop. Daddy, save mommy. Crying with tears falling into her cyanotic pale face, I felt her begin to cease, shaking as her eyes rolled back in her head in front of me and our daughter. She died in my arms seconds later. Semael walked up to me, his grin gone. I am truly sorry for your loss, he said. But you have to go. Your government is already planning to deploy their hidden chemical weapons stockpiles on this town. If you don't want you and your daughter to die in a horrible death, I recommend you find some gas masks and protective suits first, then hike to the next town over. It is your only chance. Why are you helping me? I asked, still weeping. Why couldn't you save my wife? Like I said, only you must survive. The rest of these people are collateral damage. My master had great plans for this nation and this world. But your writing will make it come true. You want me to write a book? I asked, disbelieving. He smiled cryptically. Books can change history, my friend. He said softly. Mein Kampf, the Communist Manifesto, the Bible, the Quran. All of these were planned for sowing chaos and destruction and furthering control of governments across the world. But your book will be the greatest of them all. You must espouse the greatness of transhumanism. Future leaders will look back on your writings as the turning point when humanity began to evolve to the next stage, creating a new and greater species through genetic engineering and cybernetics. No one else can write the manifesto but you. I looked up at him, disbelieving. I did believe in transhumanism, in merging the human brain with artificial intelligence, and using genetic engineering to create a greater future for humanity. But. To get the help of such dark forces just for a manifesto seemed insane. You owe us a debt, after all. If you do not do what fate dictates, my master will come for that debt in other ways. 
Perhaps we will take you, or your daughter. Perhaps your soul will be lost forever. But you are not a stupid man. You know you owe a debt. So repay us in full. This is the last time you will see me. He said. Good luck, Jason. Get out alive. With that, he turned to the remaining demons, motioning to them. They all returned through the gateway to the hellish world beyond, Semael following behind. As soon as he stepped through, the door closed. The silence was deafening. In the aftermath of so much gunfire in a confined underground space, my ears had been ringing. Now they slowly recovered. As I stood there with my wife's dead body still in my hands, my daughter softly weeping behind us, I heard footsteps through the hallway. Running, I put my wife's body down gingerly, kissing her on the forehead. I am so sorry, I said, wiping tears from my eyes. I couldn't save you. I tried. I really did. I pulled the pistol from my waistband, turning to see who was approaching. Stay here, I whispered to Sarah. I was horrified to leave her in a room with her mother's corpse for even a second, but I had to see what was coming. I stuck my head out of the door, peeking around the corner. And I saw Dr. Lau running, her eyes wide and frantic. She didn't see me until I stepped out, raising the gun and pointing it at her heart. Why did you do it? I yelled. Why did you bring back that monster? She looked from side to side, as if she expected to see help coming from the endless rooms in the labyrinthine maze of the laboratory. But no help was coming. All of the soldiers were dead, dozens of bodies strewn across the floor, some with their arms or legs ripped off. The demons had eaten the hearts and drunk the blood of many. Huge craters of bone emerged from their chests. A few dead demons were also laying among the bodies of the soldiers. The heads of the demons exploded from M4 carbine bullets. She put her hands up slowly. Look, I know this looks bad for me, but... She began, hoping for some deus ex machina that would never come. No rescue was on its way. The hive and the demons had killed all the soldiers in the area, possibly in the entire town. By this point, I thought that only airplanes were likely on their way. Airplanes filled with nuclear or chemical weapons. Or maybe if they would just decide to carpet bomb the entire area, just like Berlin at the end of World War II. I never wanted to get involved in this research, Dr. Lau said, sighing, her hands visibly trembling. I have stage 4 breast cancer. I'm going to die either way. My only hope was to join Dr. Booth in researching this serum, this royal jelly. It can reverse cancer or even death in some subjects, as you have seen. I thought that maybe. I knew where she was going with this. You thought your life would be saved by an alien fungus that transforms you into a monster? I shouted, shaking and angry. She shrugged. Not necessarily, but maybe certain genes within the organism could be discovered that could reverse cancer without the dehumanizing process. There are endless possibilities with this organism. I shook my head, disgusted. Show me where the gas masks and protective suits are, I said, motioning for Sarah to come over. My daughter, pale and trembling, ran over to my side, staying close. Keep your hands up and go slow. If you run, I will fucking kill you. My wife just died because of the research you and Dr. Booth did down here, and I am not in a forgiving mood. Dr. Lau turned around slowly, leading us down a hallway to a room marked protective gear. She opened the door, and I saw gas masks, protective suits, and medical equipment of all makes and models. Sarah, look away, I whispered. My daughter turned around. I'm sorry, Dr. Lau, but I can't trust you, I said, pulling the trigger. The gun exploded, and she fell over in a moment, shot in the heart. She died instantly. I put my arm around Sarah, covering her view with my body so that she wouldn't have to see the dead woman. I knew I had no choice except to kill Dr. Lau. She was making more of those monsters. And if she got out, she might restart this somewhere else. And yet, I felt horrible about it, shooting an unarmed woman who was dying of cancer. I had seen so many deaths already, however, 
that I was mostly desensitized. Now, I could only think of my daughter. My wife's dying wish was to get Sarah out of here. I would kill anyone along the way who I needed to. I found a gas mask in my size, and a smaller one that looked like it had been made for a petite woman that almost fit Sarah perfectly. We donned protective suits, grabbed our supplies, and got the hell out of there. I would never see that cursed laboratory again. We left the same way we had come in, hiking near the clearing where the creatures had been. Dr. Booth stood there with countless monsters, feeding on the blood of the dead soldiers scattered all over the forest. He was the undisputed king of a dead town. Not a creature moved in the forest nearby that wasn't part of the hive. I didn't hear any birds chirping or see any squirrels furtively gathering food. The whole place was silent. Dr. Booth had grown even taller, now standing over 20 feet tall. His muscles had grown and his tendrils had lengthened. He was truly the king of monsters. I avoided the area entirely, seeing this only from a distance. I hoped that the weapons that the government would deploy would kill him once and for all. I myself could do nothing. I had grabbed an M4 carbine from one of the bodies of the dead soldiers, but it certainly wasn't going to work to attack a whole hive. And this wasn't my fight. I had a daughter to think about. A mile or so down the trail, I finally found a soldier still alive, talking into his radio. The voice boomed through the forest, breaking the eerie silence. We have lost control of the area director, he said. Nearly all of our troops are lost. Please send an evac for remaining military personnel. I'm sorry, Agent Matheson, the director said through the radio. We cannot risk our aircraft for a few soldiers, especially with the risk of spreading infection. The Commander-in-Chief has authorized Operation Holy Cyclone. The deployment of Psychosarin will begin in five minutes. He paused, as if considering his next words carefully. Thank you for your service to your country. Your sacrifice will not be forgotten. With that, the radio clicked and the transmission ended. The soldier began swearing and cursing at the director. I walked away holding my daughter's hand through our protective suits, taking a white arc around the soldier. Another few miles down, and birds and squirrels began to return, though not many. And, most surprisingly of all, I found another man still alive and unmutated. But this wasn't a soldier. He was a townsperson. I saw him in a deer stand high up in the trees. I waved. He pointed a gun at me. Wait! Wait! I cried. We're just townspeople, like you. This is my little girl. I pointed at Sarah. He lowered the rifle hesitantly. Why are you wearing that crap then? He shouted down. You look like one of the feds. They have been going around murdering people you know. I saw them shoot my neighbor. I've been hiding up here ever since. Between those damned monsters and the government. His voice trailed off. We both heard the first planes overhead. They sounded like crop dusters. At first, I thought it had begun to rain again. Droplets of liquid sprinkled down. But the sun was out, and it was bright and beautiful. This was no rain. Do you smell... peaches? The man asked, looking up at the planes overhead. A few drops hit him, and... He immediately fell out of his tree stand, plummeting fifteen feet below. Oh God, my heart! He screamed, clutching at his chest, tearing his clothes apart. I ran over to him. His pupils were tiny pinpoints, his nose leaking mucus and blood. After a few more seconds, he began to vomit, defecate, and urinate simultaneously, an expression of horror and pain crossing his face. A seizure wrecked his body. He died within 30 seconds. Sarah and I looked on, horrified. Operation Holy Cyclone had begun. This must be the Psychosarin the soldiers had mentioned. The secret chemical weapon stockpiles the US government was deploying against the town in the hive. Then, I saw a few remaining birds start to fall down from the nearby trees, writhing and seizing. Their wings appeared to fail as they plummeted into the ground, spitting out frothy blood. They died quickly. 
the entire area would be exterminated of all animal life. I knew we needed to get out of here immediately. We quickly kept on walking again, eventually finding a line of dead soldiers at the border of the town, many of them with blood drained from their bodies and massive wounds across their heads and chest. After hours more following small deer trails and hidden forest paths, I made it to the next town over. My phone started pinging and I realized outgoing calls and messages could go through again. We had broken through the quarantine zone and left that cursed place behind. And yet, I had left my wife's body behind, among so many other bodies. Just thinking about her death made me want to break down. Tears began to pull in my eyes under my gas mask. I blinked my eyes rapidly. This was no time to think about the losses I had suffered. I needed to keep going. We had nearly reached safety now. We had entered a town where Dr. Booth had not infected the water supply and created an apocalypse of death and destruction. But this town looked deserted too. I looked around, realizing how eerily silent it was. Then I saw a child run out of a house. The windows shattered and the front door hanging off of its hinges. Red tendrils writhed from his mouth and body as bloody tears streamed down his face. Oh God, not again! I screamed, raising the M4 carbine and opening fire. I wanted to deal with these creatures quickly. After all, I had a book to write.